Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Can you stand up wherever you are? And as we're getting ready to hear from the Lord, commit your heart into the hands of the Lord. It's a great thing to be here in his presence. It's a purpose he allowed you to come in today as a purpose for what he wants to minister to you today. Ask God uh, help me to appreciate that. In Jesus' name we pray. We bless you, Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus' proclamation never fails. Jesus is the builder of his church. Lord, even as we come again to hear from you, we are asking, Lord, give us the undiluted word this morning in Jesus' name. As we reestablish in our hearts the basic principle and truth of the scriptures you are ministering to us today, Father, let us go out there walking in reality of the revelation in Jesus' name. We just gathered us together as part of the tools you are using to build your church. Help us wherever we are localized, O oh Lord, to do our part and be humble enough to appreciate we are building your church. Let us always be part of that church you are building in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. You can sit down and turn your scriptures to the book of Matthew chapter 16 verse 18. Gospel according to Matthew chapter 16 in verse 18. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Uh, this is a familiar scripture where Jesus confirmed the uh, <clears throat> testimony of Peter about whom Jesus Christ is. And it was a revelation message. And Jesus eventually said unto Peter, upon this revelation, upon what you stated, upon this rock, I am building my own church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's what will engage us throughout the ministration this morning on the topic that says Christ, Christ's pattern and purpose in building his church. Christ's pattern and purpose in building his church. The Lord takes personal responsibility for building the church. That's what he's saying. I will build my church church. And that church is not a physical structure like we are seeing. It is a body of born-again believers, those that are born again, rejuvenated, left the life of sin, and living in righteousness by the grace of Jesus Christ. And the Lord himself said, he is the builder. He is the one building, not any other person or not through any other individual. You see, our Lord is a unique individual. He walked on earth, but the scripture told us that even at the time he is talking, at the time he was in his earthly ministry, the fullness of Godhead was on him. So he is extraordinary. He's not just any type of person. He's a superhuman being. He's a divine personality, and he is saying, because the fullness of the Godhead in me, with or without the cooperation of anybody, he will build his own church. I will build my church. He has the master plan, and he knows the purpose for building the church. And that purpose even made him give his life for the church to draw to himself the type of church he was building. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Let the focus always be on the Lord, the builder of the church. He gave his life for it. He, here he had the pattern, and he knows the purpose for doing that. Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to read verses 25 down to 27. Ephesians chapter 5 from verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that 
Verse 27, he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. He gave his life for this church. Inestimable, valuable life. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the scriptures say the church of our Lord God, the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And the trade back for it is a glorious church that doesn't have a spot, a wrinkle, or any such thing. The true church is the church that is carved down from the systems of the world, carved down from the world and its system is a church built on the if it, a church that is built on the pattern of the world is not satisfactory to the Lord Himself. It is not the church He's talking about because such a church lacks emphasis on salvation. Just come as you are. You don't need to forsake your sin. You don't need to do anything. Just come as you are. And it is well with us. Somebody triggered the alarm. Just disable it. Press the number there. If you know the key. Where's Brolumi there? Praise the Lord. So as I was saying, he threaded, he gave his life for it to bring that church without spot or wrinkle to himself. And the church that is built in the system of the world does not emphasize conversion, does not talk about cons- uh, sanctification. It is a friendly seeker church, a church that wants to pattern itself in a way that if you come in, you are looking for a church that's friendly, that does not want to emphasize the need for freedom from sin and talk about that as a condition to go into heaven, that's the church you have. And brethren, if you have a privilege to partner with the Lord in building the church, remember, it is still him that is building not you who came as, as a partner to build with him. Always remember he is the builder. There might be a Peter, there might be a Paul preaching. And then when that preaching takes place, it is not the preaching that builds the church. It's not the effort of Peter. Jesus is actually using his discretion in using each tool to now build his church to the required desired standard. Acts of Apostles chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, reading there verses 46 and 47. In Acts chapter 2, the fact that you could organize a church and people are there, is still the Lord building. You could be an agent, but he is the builder. Acts chapter 2, look at it, verses 46 to 47. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. You see a typical assembly there, a typical local church there, with the pastor, with the workers, with all the brethren working together in this administration to do that. They could think they are the one doing it. No, look at verse 47. It flows into it. Praising God and having favor with all the people. Can you read the last one with me? One, two, go. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. As you look at faces in the church, don't just be proud and say it's me adding them. No, it's nothing to do with you. Especially those that faithfully want to make heaven. You just say to God puts you there. He is the one that eventually acts. If you fail to cooperate with the Lord in reaching in building his church, maybe in your evangelizing outline, you are outreaches, you have a different kind of message that will appeal to this audience, and then you want to create a new church or create a, a, a doctrine or create a standard that will just be comfortable for that person so that you lure that person in. That person could physically be in the church, but it's not God that is adding that person because. 
if you fail to cooperate with him, he still is the one that will build his own church. He will tear away any attachment that does not match his own pattern and purpose. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, reading verses 10 and 11, he remains the one building the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, he borrowed it, he got it. As a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builded thereon. But let every man take heed how he builded thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He's the pattern, he has the building plan, he has the pattern, he has a purpose, he's the one that is building his church. And there's no way the church Jesus is building will have a meeting point with the world. The system of the world, no. The system of the world is built on lust of the flesh, is built on lust of the eye, and pride of life. All these, the scriptures say, they are passing away. Lustfulness, pride, flesh, uh, and everything about pride of life, they are all passing away. They cannot meet together with the church Jesus is building. If ever they meet, then that structure you are calling a church is going to collapse eventually because you are building on a ground that will not last. Jesus, scripture tells us on the last day, some will come. We did this, we prophesied, we ran church, we did this and that. He says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that walk iniquity, because you are not building on the foundation that is laid. You see, the foundation of a church that is built on the system of the world, it leads to compromise. It leads to cooperation with the church, compliance with the church, condescension. You condescend to their level. You are commingling with them. You are cohabiting with them. A church Jesus gave his life for, after no other option is given, it's a church that is without spot, without wrinkle. It's a church that he wants to get to himself. There's no emotion about it. You should also make sure that it is a church you have in mind and a church you belong to. And the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Oh, Amen is so small. Yeah. Praise the Lord. I'm just starting to know, and your Amen has gone down. Three points. Number one, Savior's promise and power to build the true church. We'll be excited. We need to know this. It's a common reference we started with, but let's still refer, remind ourselves things that are biblically true. Savior's promise and power to build the true church. Point number two, Satan's plot and persecution against the true church. Church. You see, the thing you know about a true church and a true believer is persecution that comes to you. We are in the world, we are not of the world. If your Christianity has never suffered persecution, you will see that you will need to re-examine it again because you are in another kingdom and you want to establish God's righteous standard. There has to be a pushback. It's normal. That's what we are talking, Satan's plot and persecution against the true church. Finally, we look at Savior's protection and preservation of the true church. Despite the persecution, the Lord we are serving is able to keep you, and he will keep you till the end in Jesus' name. Point number one, what is it? Savior's promise and power to build the true church. Always have your hand in Matthew chapter 16. I'm going to read verse 18. Gospel according to Matthew chapter 16 in verse 18. You see again, we read it before, but now we are looking at his promise and power to build the church. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail 
against it. You see, we see an irrefutable promise by the Lord himself. I will build my church. The Lord Jesus who said it has an irresistible authority that brings to fulfillment everything he has ever said. If you know him when he walked on earth, he said a lot of things. And you will keep searching up till now, except for those that are still in the future that will still be fulfilled, which will be fulfilled. But if you search through all the scriptures, those he said when he was on earth, you will never find one statement of his that went unfulfilled. He still said them, they came to pass. Like that time he told them, let us go over to the other side. Told the apostles they were in a boat. And the storm came on the way. Eventually the scripture ended in the next chapter. They came over to the other side. By the time he came, he would command and say, foul spirit gets out. Immediately he goes out. Time he will tell them, go to this place. You see this individual. Uh, there's a lamb there. There's this thing there. We're going to have Passover in that place. He, he tell, ask the good man of the house, where have you prepared a place for us? They went, it happened literally like that. Before his crucifixion, he told them, listen, after this number of days, I'm going to be crucified. Three days after, I will rise again. Everything literally happened as he said it, as it were. Why? Because of the quality of his word. In fact, he said it in Matthew chapter 24, verse 35. Matthew's gospel chapter 24, in verse 35. Always worth remembering. We're still going back to his promise to build his church. He says, Matthew chapter 24, in verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my ways shall not pass away. You believe that? And that word includes, I will build my church. Up to this time, he is still building his church. Up to this time, his authority, he has proclaimed it and he's building his church. What it means is that Satan, devil, demonic powers, evil men, whatever of nature they are, they can team up to stop him against building the church, but they will never succeed at all. They can come together, use whatever they need, and they want to stop him from building the church. It's not going to happen at all because he said, this is what I will do. If you go to a construction site, you could use your as a matter of fact as a tool, but it doesn't mean you are the one building the church. In a construction site, get there. Maybe you have a site engineer, the overall person in charge of the project itself. He has discretion to choose an architect, choose the plumber, choose the electrician, and then even the materials to be used on site. Put this one here, put the other one there. The box stops in his own table. The architect will not say, I'm taking sole credit. Is a site engineer. Is a man, the ultimate authority that is at the site itself that is responsible for what is happening. The same thing, you could be a Christian worker. You could be a leader. You could be an ordinary member. You could be a soul winner in the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is just demobilizing each and every one of us, helping us to be tools in his hand, in building the church as it were. Ephesians chapter 4. In the book of Ephesians chapter 4, I'm going to read verses 11 to 13. Ephesians chapter 4 from verse 11 to um, 13. From verse 11. And he gave some. That's Jesus Christ. He gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. You see, any teacher he has given is not to corrupt the body. Any soul winner is given is not to pollute the gospel message. It's for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the defining of the body of Christ. Till we come, you see, he has a pattern, purpose. We come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of a son of God unto what? A perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of 
Christ. That's his own purpose. That is what you look at in any assembly, and that's what you look at in your own ministry as well. He is greater than any single or corporate members of a true church. Therefore, we are obligated to give heed to Jesus Christ, especially in the body of believers, in his own church. In a church you say represents Jesus Christ himself. We need to consider him, consider his virtues and his purpose in building the church. Hebrews chapter 3. In Hebrews chapter 3, reading verses 1 to 4. Hebrews chapter 3, from verse 1 to 4. Very clear. Wherefore, holy brethren, it's appealing to all of us, partakers of the heavenly call, you've been called to run this race and do all that's supposed to be done. What do you do? Consider the apostle and high priests of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who had built the house had more honor than what? The house. He is a builder, and he is the one that has more honor than the house. So when you come in and you are building, Make sure you know who is a builder. You respect him. Consider him. He has more honor. True Christianity or true church may have witnessed ministers that of great stature, Moses, Elijah, and the rest of them. They could also have witnessed ministers that actually have devoted themselves into undermining the church. People like Pharaoh, people like Sambalat and Tobiah, Judas, Iscariot, and the rest of them. Your intelligence could make you eloquent. It could make you uh, undermine the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, be unfaithful to him, and abandon the work of God. But the point remains, in the midst of all these things, Jesus is still the builder of the church. He has factored in all these things, all the discrepancies that could ever happen within his church, and he keeps building the church. The only thing is when we get over there, we get our reward in accordance with the way we acted. So don't think you come in here, you could be a spoiler and do this, and then the church uh, doesn't move on. No, it doesn't work that way. He has known ahead of time whatever role anybody is going to play. Look at Acts chapter 15. Acts of Apostles chapter 15, reading there verses 14 down to 18. Look at that scripture and see. And see God playing out his role. And see how he skillfully builds his church in the midst of intricate, intricate maneuvers. And for us, we are looking at it, we are shuddering. It doesn't take God by surprise. He knows what he's doing and he's keeping his mind attuned to that. Acts chapter 15, are you there? I'm reading from verse 14. From verse 14, Simeon had declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Simeon was an unwilling partner, but God still had his way, and then he brought Gentiles in. And to this agree, the word, the words of the prophets as it is written. Now he's talking about prophecy. After this, I will return and we build again. He says the builder. As at that time, Peter was saying, I never have taken anything. He was a master builder. He factored dating. And then I will return and we build again the tabernacle of David, which is falling down. And I will build again the ruins thereof and I will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord. Worldwide issue. And all the Gentiles, upon whom my name is called, say the Lord, who doeth all this sin. Can we read verse 18 together? One, two, go. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. He's known them. All of them from the beginning. In other words, say another way. God is never taken by surprise. Before you that's hearing me was born into this world, he is committed to build his church. 
before you were born again and your eyes were open, God had been building his church. Only thing is that when your eye opened now, you shout, why wasn't it open much longer, much earlier than the time it happened? After you pass on, if Jesus tarries, God is still building his church. Because he's sovereign, he can do all things with or without you. It's a privilege to be part of the church and be building with him. But with or without you, God's church keeps marching on. And this is not enough for you. You don't come in because you want to partner with him, which is a privilege. You now lose sight of the purpose of the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. Have that in mind. And then let it not be a factor in affecting you in building together with him. Maybe you go out to evangelism field, and then you are afraid, if I don't minister this way, I won't reach to these people and bring them in, and you are whittling down the thing. Or you have the opportunity of maybe running an assembly, and you are afraid that uh, membership will dwindle, assuming we stick to the right word of God and state the word of God as it were. Uh, they will go back. We just read in John chapter 6, where Jesus told Peter, won't you also go away? He never wanted to moderate the standard because he's afraid of the crowd that they are going to go out there. And then because of opposition to sound word of God from quarters you never expected, you are now saying, oh, it's time to cool down, it's time to soften it so that we can accommodate, accommodate them. You could do that, but then it's a new, another heaven that you are getting those people into because it's not what Jesus expects of a true believer. In the midst of any opposition, any appreciation, keep on on the narrow path. If the people are against you or for you because you're carrying the Bible and you want to hear the word of God and follow strictly in accordance with the biblical standard, you keep moving on. The other day we challenged ourselves about heavenly risk. It's a personal race. You don't look at your husband. You don't look at your wife. You get committed yourself. All you need to know is, am I obeying the Lord? Is it the scriptures that I'm hearing? Is it what is expected? Don't look at whatever they are doing in other places and whatever they are doing, what another person is doing. Just maintain your call. Psalm number 93. Psalm number 93, verses 4 and 5. In Psalm 93, look at verses 4 and 5. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters. He's saying whatever waters are going here, confusion here and there, God is on high. He is mightier than those commotions going down here. Yeah, than the mighty waves of the sea storm and whatever it is in any place, any society, any nation, he's high up there. He's building his church. Look at verse 5. In the midst of those storms, thy testimonies are very sure. Holiness becometh thy house, O Lord, forever. In the midst of the storm, everything going on and so on, you know, emotionally connected with people, and then it's up to wanting to lose your guard, and then getting to lusting and everything. God is up there. Those emotions you're expressing, no, they don't affect my standard for the church, which is holiness, in or out, and forevermore. I am up there, whatever was going up there, I'm building a holy church. You'll be part of that church in Jesus' name. Amen. Point number two, Satan's plot and persecution against the true church. In, a, in Matthew chapter 16, reading verse 18, Matthew's gospel chapter 16, in verse 18, And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the case of hell shall not prevail against it. That's the one we are looking at. The case of hell shall not prevail against the church. 
two sorts of notice that there's an expected battle from the gates of hell, expected battle from, the, from Satan against the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. There's a battle going on, and that battle continues. But look at where the Lord waited in concerning it. Matthew chapter 11, in verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. And the Lord is giving us a timeline. And he says from the time of John the Baptist, the New Testament battle for the kingdom started. And then those that are violent will take it by force. Of course, you know when he came on the earth, Herod wanted to kill him. It was that time. The battle line was already drawn. And apart from me, when he finished his 40 days fasting, Satan wanted to stop him from going to the cross itself. You know all the things. Men faced him in opposition, Sadducees, Pharisees, Christ, and all the learned people in the land. He faced a position that was very stiff. Then eventually they crucify him. He resurrected in power. And you will see that Jesus, before he was crucified, referred to his apostles about the battles that was raging on and giving them notice that this is exactly what you are going to face. In John chapter 16, or chapter 15, gospel according to John chapter 15 from verse 18, he, gave, he put them on notice and told them this is a battle that is going to continue raging in your camp. And that's why we're seeing what we're seeing presently. John chapter 15, look at it from verse 18 down to 20. From verse 18, I will arise and go to my father. And I was, oh, I was looking at, look. John chapter 15, reading there from verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it had hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hated you. Remember the word that I said unto you? The servant is not greater than the, his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. As a battle raging on. And the Lord puts us on notice that Satan and his demonic powers are still at work. Uh, check out the other day, a few days back, a minister of the gospel preaching the word of God. And suddenly a man came with a gun and pointed at him and shot. Fortunately, the, the Lord drank the uh, gun. He didn't shoot. But then he led to the process of wrestling the man, a uh, troubled individual. And the pastor was being interviewed. What happened? And the man said, we saw the man. He will come. He will go back. He, suddenly, he pulled the gun and then uh, started shooting and so on. And the man was interviewed. Why did you do that? He said, I just came in, I was watching. It's like somebody was telling me, go, go and go and shoot, go and shoot. Why? Irritation against the word of God and the man of God was ministering and he wanted to stop that from coming out. These are type of battles we're talking about, forces of darkness fighting. Satan and his cohorts are working. They are still at work opposing us and the uh, uh, people of God, men of God, from propagating the gospel message the Lord wants us to use, to do. And sometimes, mostly, not sometimes, that you can see Satan on the street and identify him. He uses people in position of authority. He uses mere mortals to now carry on the message of persecuting the church. Acts of Apostles chapter 4, for instance. Look at Acts chapter 4. Look at verse 18. In Acts chapter 4, in verse 18. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of 
Jesus. Don't do that. People in authority, because they know that when they speak, the apostles ought to hear. And they commanded them and say, never do that. We know about Paul the Apostle in Acts chapter 8, 9, even from 8. When Stephen died, persecution came and so on. And they, Peter, Paul went and got authority from the rulers to go and persecute people that are going through the way itself. That's what they do. That's what the powers of darkness do. But the thing is this, brethren, the best of men, they are still mortal in the hand of God. Pharaoh, Nebuchadnezzar, Hero, Hero, and Nero, whatever opposition they raise, the Lord says, I will keep building my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Check, for instance, in the early church at Jerusalem. They were rebuking them. We read part of it. It was still confined in Jerusalem. The powers that be, they came together and they said, no, this is too much. It will not happen. We will do anything. You can't do anything against the truth of the gospel. That's the truth about it. You could try whatever effort you are doing. And at the end of it all, God is building his own church. Look at what happened. All the opponents, uh, Herod and the rest of them, up to Nero, they died. They are already gone. The gospel message spread beyond Jerusalem to all over the world in accordance with exactly what God has promised them that it will be. It is your turn today. You still have that gospel message. It is still fresh and hot. Hold on to it. Pass it to others in an undiluted manner. Don't look at oppositions and press, uh, push back from the enemy. The Lord will help you do that in Jesus' name. Look at Philippians chapter 1, an encouragement that is there. In Philippians chapter 1, look at verse 28. Philippians chapter 1 in verse 28. Philippians chapter 1 in verse 28, and it says, and then nothing, absolutely nothing, be terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. In other words, your Christian life, your conduct and comportment, it judges them. It makes them see judgment of God in them. When you tell them there's a possibility of living in victory over sin, and they are clinging to their sin partners and thinking their life depends on that relationship, they wouldn't want to hear that. They wouldn't want to fathom it at all. When you come as a modest Christian believer and you are looking at, as a modest Christian, a model Christian in conduct, attire, and everything, it judges them and it says, it is an evident token of perdition. So they will now oppose you. They want to fight against you. They want to hold on and then push back against you. Brethren, the Lord is telling you this morning, whatever it is you are passing through, whatever storms or waves from the powers of darkness against you because of your Christian conviction, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the living stone, the one that says, I build my church, the gates of hell will not prevail. He has laid the foundation, and that foundation, he is telling you, you will never be destroyed in Jesus' name. Let fear not push you back at all. Because the Lord you are serving has the capability, even in the midst of the storm, to make you be an overcomer. Luke's Gospel, chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, reading from verses 17 to 19. Gospel according to Luke, chapter 21, from verse 17 down to 19. Look at what he said. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Never think you have come to a cruising zone as a believer, especially if you want to believe the word of God to the end. He said, you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but there shall not an hair of your head perish. Verse 19, can we read it together? One, two, go. In your patience, possess ye your soul. Not one hair will perish in your life in Jesus' name. 
and your soul will possess it patiently, waiting upon the Lord. He has not discountenance. He knows you are there. You will be part of that overcoming church itself. And hold on, walk that narrow road. Whatever you are seeing, whatever signs you are seeing, don't worry. God is behind the scene walking. As we get ready to move to the next point in this, uh, bring the message to a close, I want to tell you something. If you want to be part of the overcoming church and be part of beneficiary of what the Lord did and said concerning his church, you have to push back. The best form of defense or attack. Attack is the best form of defense, rather. That's what they use in the military term. You don't just stay and you are defending yourself, defending yourself. Carry the battle to the enemy's front. Move ahead. They remove yourself from defending. The kingdom suffers violence. The violence will take it. You have to push back against the system of the world and their own pattern. You don't just become a docile Christian and have my Bible and just do my quiet time. Uh, so I'm going to give you about seven critical things you ought to be doing as a way of pushback against the onslaught of the wicked and the satanic forces and you're going to heaven. It's a matter of life or death. Number one, what do you do in terms of pushing back against the powers of darkness and what they are doing to hold you back? Preach the word. Preach the word. That's what I'm saying. That's the first pushback you are going. A lot of benefits are packed in preaching the word. It makes you come out boldly before them and tell them, I am part of Christ. And this is what I believe. And you sometimes run into a familiar crowd and they will want to know, are you doing exactly what you are doing? So you see that evangelism helps you to be on your toes, to live out the life you are prescribing unto others. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, reading verses 12 to 14. Matthew chapter 24, you need to preach the word. Preach it. No matter how difficult the enemy and the onslaught is, preach that word. Matthew chapter 24, from verse 12 down to verse 14. Matthew chapter 24, reading from verse 12. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. That's in our society right now, the right way. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. You'll be saved in Jesus' name. But look at the assignment for you in verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Preach that word in the midst of pressure. Number two, second thing you are going to do, proclaim always the basis of your salvation. Always be ready to proclaim the basis of your salvation. Anybody that wants to know, let them know this is what I believe in. This is it that the Lord has imparted in me. First Peter chapter 3 in verse 15. First Peter chapter 3, look at it in verse 15. It says it very clearly there and says, but sanctify the Lord in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Don't be a secret disciple. No Nicodemus at night and so on. No. They will look at it and see the changes and they say, what? Be ready and tell them, this is what I have. This is me. Even though it will attract persecution, it doesn't matter. Tell them. Look at verse 16. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you, persecuting you as evil doers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. They will see the grace of God at work in you. You are a builder with the Lord. Jesus has grafted you into the body. You are part of that body that is, Jesus said is indestructible. And you also building in accordance with the pattern. They will see it, whatever accusation, it will fizzle out. Number three, prayerfully stay at your duty post. Prayerfully stay at your duty post. That one you see in Luke chapter 18. You see it in verse 1. Men ought always to pray. Then he went to talk about parables and after giving illustration about the parable, he now said, when the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith on 
Ah, if this uh, widow woman was able to rescue this uh, um, judge, how about God as, uh, responding to you? Stay in your duty post. Number four, pursue after righteousness at all times. Seek righteousness. Seek it. In fact, the scripture tells us in Matthew chapter 5, in verse 6, he said, blessed are those that seek and test after righteousness, for they shall be fulfilled. Seek it, test for it, crave for it, look for it. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Number six, number five, thank you. Number five, purposefully resolve to push back. Purposefully resolve to push back. Brethren, we are living in a society in which custom, culture, changes, and so on are speedily wanting to corrupt us and wanting us to play around. And, but you need to know where you are going. You need to know Jesus is building a church. You need to know it's a new test. For instance, the thing playing out in the Middle East or any aspect of it. And you are waiting for Jesus to come back. Is it time you really align with those that want to exterminate any indication of uh, any presence of the church or presence of anything that will relate to where Jesus is coming down the second time to now come and reign on earth? Have your focus, know the builder, know the pattern of God, and know how all these things will end. It's just like you are in Egypt at that point in time, and you are an Egyptian, and you are supporting forced labor on Israelites, and the cheap labor building edifice for them. You could tend, tend to say, ah, if they live, how could we maintain this economy? And you are against their living. It's just the same thing. You take, you take a position. And what is playing out in the Middle East, look at it from the perspective of what God has in mind for his church. If you are building with him, you should actually pray along the pattern of his perfect will to be done and not be emotional about them. I'm telling you there is emotion on any side, left or right. But the point is, truth is absolute. You make up your mind. This is the truth out of the whole thing. Then damn emotion on the negative, negative side, especially emotion that will make you to want to thwart God's overall plan for the church. We are waiting for the Lord. We are waiting for the manifestation of him. And the signs are showing us it's coming. It's not time to now sort of pleading for God, for the blindness of his people in the natural. You're pleading the other side of it. That's the point the Lord wants us to appreciate here. So purposeful result to push back. Daniel chapter 1. As an example, Daniel chapter 1 in verse 8. Daniel chapter 1. In verse 8, it says, But Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat. I am not going to defile myself with Halloween. I'm not going to defile myself with, uh, is it uh, egg or whatever pumpkin they take during Easter, uh, Easter, Easter egg, whatever it is, and the clothing and so on. Make a consecration, even in your workplace, even in your residence, and they're organizing something, and they want this type of attire to, you know, for some of the spirit beings that they say it represents. A believer has no business in doing any of them. Purpose in your heart. Daniel purposed in his heart that he will not defy himself. You will not defy yourself in Jesus' name. Number six, praise God during persecution. Persecution will come, but it's not the time you tell Jesus, I never bargained for this. Why would this happen? Why are they now belittling me? Why are they doing this or that? And persecution could come from any side. What you do is be rejoice, be ever joyful, in the midst of it. Yeah, it could come from every, any side, but it doesn't mean the believer will persecute another believer. I'm talking about unbelievers. And when you face it from unexpected quarters, just rejoice. Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, it says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. For my sake, because we are a believer, rejoice, be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before 
you. If you look at this verse, great is your reward in heaven, it shows you that no persecution will really get you under to lose heaven. And that's why he say, say reward packed up there in heaven for you. You will not miss your reward in Jesus' name. Number six. Number seven, thank you. Seven, finally. Patiently anticipate your final redemption. Patiently anticipate your final redemption. Look at Luke chapter 21. Gospel according to Luke, chapter 21, reading there verse 28. Luke chapter 21 in verse 28. Very clear. It says, and when these things begin to happen or begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads. Why? For your redemption draweth nigh. As it's becoming inexplicable and it's like, can I survive the next day? Just look up. Are you building with Jesus? Don't worry. Soon, night, night is for a moment, day is coming. Soon and very soon. He said, look up. In the midst of it, your redemption draweth nigh. The trumpet sounds, you take on the glorified body and you leave the earth and this system permanent buy to a bad rubbish. You will be part of those that will escape that in Jesus' name. Finally, Savior's protection and preservation of the true church. Savior's protection and preservation of the true church. In Matthew chapter 16, look at verse 18. Matthew chapter 16 in verse 18, and I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Are you part of that church? And he says, the gates of hell will not prevail against that church. It includes you in Jesus' name. You see, many a time we like publicity Christianity. It's not what God really looks at. He just look at you at that little corner where you are. Are you faithful? That's the one he takes and grass in the church and puts you in there, not known by anybody at all. But his eyes is watching you very well. And here he's giving you a firm assurance, the master builder, and he's saying the world may not know you. The church where you are may not even know you. You are not in the register of the who is who in the world. But are you faithfully working with me? Are you part of the master building plan that I have? If you are, then don't worry. One thing I know is that the protective promise I gave for the church, you're part of it. Success is written in your forehead. You will succeed and be overcome in Jesus' name. He's very clear about you. Whatever persecution you are facing, God is saying it's for a while. Deliverance is around the corner. And today, you will have it in Jesus' name. Look at a legitimate question he asks in Isaiah chapter 49. Having you in mind, maybe you are there, cornered one way or the other. Challenges here and there. And you are saying, this, is, this thing, does it apply to me? Am I able to be part of this glorious church? Is it possible the enemy has captivated me? He has cornered me? I'm hopeless. I'm helpless. I don't even know where the next meal is coming and um, capture this one and the other one, a bright day is coming. The Lord is opening up a new vista for you. Your deliverance is coming today in Jesus' name. Isaiah 49, look at it, verses 24 to 26. Isaiah chapter 49, from verses 24 down to 26. Shall the prey be taken from the mighty or the lawful captive delivered. Maybe you are in the depth of sin. You've never even started with the Lord. And Satan has bound your cultic powers and you keep consulting herbalists and so on. You are a lawful captive. Maybe one way or the other, you lost hope in God. And then faithlessness means lack of favor from God. And the enemy has captivated you. And he says, shall the lawful captive be taken from the mighty or the lawful captive delivered? But, there's a but in your life this morning. 
But thus saith the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I, that I, the same person that say I build my church, is saying, for I will contend with him that contended with thee, and I will do what? Save thy children. He's looking even beyond you and saying, apart from you, your children and the people you care for, I will save them. Verse 26, and I will feed them that oppress thee with their own flesh. Amen? Amen. And they shall be drunken with their own blood. Amen? Amen. As with sweet wine, and all flesh shall know that I, the Lord, I am thy Savior, thy Redeemer, the mighty one of Jacob, and the builder of the New Testament church in Jesus' name. He said, I will do it. He will do it in your life in Jesus' name. Many a time you belittle what is inside of you. And you spend time thinking, if I had been at this level, done that. No, just consider the seed of the word of God in you. It has such incredible capabilities to deliver you from sin, to rescue you from damnation, and all the powers of darkness and their plan is just innumerable. What the seed of the word of God, undiluted word of God, is in you, and which if you proclaim, which you know about and confess, sets you free from any, virtually any kind of entanglement. Look at Esther chapter 6. In the book of Esther chapter 6, see a demonstration of that. You'll be wondering, why going to the Old Testament? Yes, even from there, we had people with the seed of God in them, and you see the effect of it. The book of Esther chapter 6. Esther chapter 6. Go to Esther, please. After Second Chronicles, you see Ezra, Nehemiah, and then you see Esther. I'm waiting for you, every one of us. Apparently, we need to take it as a last text. In Esther chapter 6, verses 13 and 12. Esther chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. Are you there? Let's still wait a little bit patiently for those that are still turning. Many of us are there now. We there? Good. Look at Esther chapter 6. Verses 12 and 13. Actually, I'm going to 13, but let's be, let me begin from verse 12. And Mordecai came again to the king's gate, but Haman hasted to his house, mourning, and having his head covered. Mordecai was an unknown kind of individual, a gate man. He wasn't even a corridor of power. Haman was the right hand man of the king. You see, it's even, uneven. But Haman decided to pick on the child of God. And look at what Haman's wife told him. And Haman told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends, everything that had befallen him. Then said his wise men and Zeresh, his wife, unto him. Can we read that together? One, two, go. If Mordecai be of the seed of the Jews, before whom thou hast begun to fall, then shall not prevail against him, but shall surely fall before him. Look at it again. It's like saying, if you, your name is Esther or whatever it is, you have the seed of God in you. Satan already has started falling. By the time you became born again. So he has fallen the first one. Then you will not prevail against her. You will surely fall before her in the challenges ahead. Does it make sense for you? Yes. yes. And that's the truth of the scripture. That was the time that Esther already said, this is Mordecai who wants, Haman who wants to exterminate our people. And the king was enraged. Mordecai now ran, Haman ran back to his wife. And Zaresh said, what? You didn't tell me this man is a Jew. Is that so? He's part of the invisible church, indefatigable church, the church that nobody can bring down. 
That's the church you belong to. Nobody will bring you down in Jesus' name. From today, the enemy will hear that Satan fell before. By the time you escape from the captivity of sin, now he's bringing another challenge, and the Lord is saying, I build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail. They will not prevail against you in Jesus' name. Rise up and let's go to God in prayers and commit yourself into the hands of the Lord and tell God I'm part of that church. I am part of that church. I will build in accordance with the model. I will not substitute what you want me to do as a member of that church with what I prefer or what people are putting pressure upon me to do. I will build in accordance with the pattern, O oh Lord. The building you've given to me, the instruction you've given, I will do that. And then here I am, repelling all the powers of darkness, standing on the promises of God to deliver me, that nothing, nothing will hold, Father Lord, my, come against me in terms of having victory. Powers of darkness, opposition, and everything. In fact, make a covenant and tell God, I'm taking the battle to the field of the enemy. I'm taking the battle to the field of the wicked one. I am going to be offensive in my defense. I will counter attack. The kingdom suffered violence. I am going to be violent about it. I will not compromise. I will make a determination. I will stand firm. I will always proclaim the basis of my salvation. I will persevere despite persecution, O oh Lord. I will even rejoice in the midst of the persecution. I will preach the word in and out of season. I will counter the enemy. Lord, I'm not defeated. I will not be defeated for any reason. Open your mouth and call upon God. Open your mouth and pray and believe God. He will rescue you. He will deliver you. Shall the love, lawful captive be delivered? Today you are delivered. Today you are delivered. And he will contend with those that contend against you. Because the seed of God is in you. The seed of God is in you. The seed of victory is in you. The seed that is impregnable. The seed that is indestructible. The seed that the enemy will not conquer. It is in you. It is in you. Pray. The Lord wants to hear you pray. He wants to hear you pray. Talk to the Lord. Tell him, here I am, O Lord. Be a Daniel, be a Daniel, determine ahead of time. Don't look at Pharaoh, Sambalas, Tobias, and Judas, Iscariots in the church. Don't look at them. They are in a momentary phase. They are passing away. Remember all the opposition against the church in the early church? Barely 2,000 years ago. Yet, you see the church is spread all over the world. Align with the truth of the gospel. Believe what the Lord said you are. Believe what he promised he will do. I build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. That is the church we're presenting to you. That is the church the glory of God is confirming. That's the church you'll be part of. I don't know any other church, but the one by the God of the Bible say, I build my church, the gates of hell will not prevail. He gave himself that he might present unto himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. It's not a church built on traditions of the world. There's no difference between you and those that are following Jesus. You say you are going to heaven. No difference between you do, with those that are collecting bribe, corruption. You say you are going to heaven. No difference between you and those living licentious lifestyle. Same partners here and there. Exchanging lurid uh, images among themselves. Suggestive texts and so on. You say you are going to church? No. It's not the heaven we're talking about. 
People lie, you lie with them. They see, you see with them. Is that a church you belong to? No. A glorious church without spot or wrinkle. It's a church within the church. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Get out of sin. Jesus has capability to keep you spotless. This glorious church, it will make you moody. It will make you so concerned about what is happening on earth. Look up. Your redemption draweth near. If there's no sin in your camp, the righteous as bold as a lion. Face the future. The lion of Judah is going with you to deliver you, to set you free. He is doing that. He has told you, giving you that assurance. Has he not called you? Has he not commanded you? Move ahead. Victory will be yours. You've labored for the Lord. Those you preach into the kingdom, probably they've gone to glory. They are waiting for you. They are waiting for you. Are you going to miss it? No. Keep pushing on. Peter said, to whom do we go to? Keep pushing on. You will make it. His grace will be sufficient for you. In Jesus' name we pray. We pray in Jesus' name. Thank you, everlasting Father, because you've graciously poured your word into our hearts. Even though it's a familiar scripture law, you use it to remind us the basic principle of the purpose and pattern of your church. And Lord, we receive all these things with appreciation in Jesus' name. We are sure of the fact we are part of that church, O oh Lord. The church, you say, the gates of hell will not prevail. Father, we are marching with that church. We are part of that church without spot or wrinkle, and nothing will remove us from that in Jesus' name. As we keep going on, O oh Lord, challenges will come that want to drive us back. Like Peter the Apostle will say, we are not going back. No going back for any reason in Jesus' name. The seed of the word that is in us, just like in the life of Mordecai, O oh Lord, that's the seed of victory. Anything that is an obstacle on our way, because we have that seed, victory will be ours in Jesus' name. Blessed be your name, Father. It is done. Not just for us, members of our family, our children, our relations, people we care for, oh Lord. We are going to be overcomers at the end in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, because you've done it. In Jesus' name we pray.